All right. Well, good morning, everyone, or afternoon, as the case may be. My name is James Brody, and I would first like to thank everyone for taking the time out of your busy schedules to att attend today's webinar. With many in the industry recognizing that there's likely to be a renewed focus on regulatory compliance issues with the swearing in of the new Biden administration, we count ourselves fortunate to once again have the opportunity to collaborate with the Mortgage Collaborative and to co-host today's program titled Second Annual Regulatory Roundup and Valuable Tips for Maintaining Compliance in 2021 and Beyond. Although it goes without saying that there's only so much ground that we will be able to cover in an hour to an hour and a half that we have allotted for this program, I'm confident that you will find the material we cover today to be very informative as we all continue to navigate the ever-changing world of regulatory compliance. Now, that being said, before we get into the meat of today's presentation, I want to provide some information about myself, Johnston Thomas, as well as provide our co-host, Thomas Gallucci, uh, to introduce himself and the collaborative. As to the proviso, uh, what type of attorney would I be if I did not first take a moment to give you the standard disclaimer that nothing in today's presentation constitutes legal advice or creates an attorney-client relationship? Still, should you have any follow-up questions at the conclusion of today's program, I welcome you to send such to my attention, and we will be sure to prepare and provide a follow-up FAQ document for all of today's attendees. As for myself, I am the chairman of Johnston Thomas's Mortgage Banking Practice Group, where I manage and oversee all the complex mortgage banking litigation, mitigation, and compliance matters for our diverse clientele of lenders, brokers, credit unions, and more from all across the country. Now, amongst the many legal services that our firm offers the mortgage banking industry, uh, these include, but are in no way limited to, uh, assisting with the regulatory compliance needs from crafting and negotiating loan purchase agreements, to drafting MLO compensation agreements and MSAs, to conducting mock CFPB audits, and helping with our clients' multi-state licensing needs. In addition, while our compliance practice tends to be forward-looking, we are also heavily involved in more backwards-looking services, such as defending lenders and brokers against reps and warrant claims, uh, pursuing everyone involved in the financial transactions to the extent they caused any harm to our clients, and much more. This would include uh, things such as the Lehman Brothers litigation, JP Morgan Chase pursuing parties. Uh, but fortunately, as many of you know, the amount of claims since the meltdown have drastically increased, and that is a good thing. Now, for our co-host, which should not need any introduction given their prominent involvement in our industry, including their hundreds of lender members and vendors, we have Mr. Thomas Gallucci, Senior VP of Business Development for the Mortgage Collaborative. Tom, if you wouldn't mind giving a very brief introduction to yourself and TMC, as well as a little bit of information on how TMC is helping its members and the industry at large address the ever-present compliance and many other needs, uh, I think that would be a great start. James, I'd be more than happy to, and, and thank you first off for just the opportunity to participate as well as co-host our second annual Regulatory Roundup Compliance Rundown for 21. Um, first off, I have to say I'd be remiss if I didn't recognize James and his integral contributions to the Mortgage Collaboratives Network and you know, supporting our members' legal and compliance-related needs, really since prior to my joining of the Mortgage Collaborative now five years ago, um, and we've really enjoyed our exclusive partnership with Johnson Thomas's mortgage banking practice focused really on regulatory compliance as well as repurchase litigation coming up on two years now. Um, for me, I've been with the Mortgage Collaborative, as I mentioned, about five years now. Get to manage our 65 and best plus best in class preferred partnerships that span really across the mortgage origination life cycle and help support the needs of our growing lender member network, um, as well as getting to oversee the execution of our educational networking platform, TMC Connect, which I'll talk a little bit more about. Uh, as well as the Mortgage Collaboratives events in person and both virtual, uh, in addition to our co-marketing initiatives. So, real quickly on the Mortgage Collaborative, um, 
Yeah, we are the nation's largest independent cooperative serving the mortgage industry and are privileged to support more than 220 lender member organizations uh, with recurring educational content such as today's session on our TMC Connect platform, uh, as well as through our partnership, you know, multiple written articles uh, annually focused around news and legal updates impacting the mortgage banking industry, which comes directly from Johnston Thomas. So I do want to remind attendees today, especially our lender members at the Mortgage Collaborative, that as part of our partnership with Johnston Thomas, TMC members are entitled to a pair of 30-minute complimentary consultations on an annual basis, uh, as well as 10% off the retail costs of their engagements with Johnston Thomas. Um, Real quickly on the benefits of membership, and James, you can feel free to jump to the next slide as I'll kind of dive into each of these bulleted items. Uh, first off is TMC Benchmark. This is the Mortgage Collaborative's monthly data benchmarking tool that generates highly visual and interactive data analytics, as well as uh, dashboards for our members, really to impact the way they're making business decisions. The cool part about it only takes about 20 minutes per month to complete. And then the lenders in turn receive over 50 important KPI metrics that help support their mortgage banking operations. Currently, we've got more than 100 members actively using. Uh, you can jump to the next slide. Uh, as I mentioned before, TMC Connect is our educational networking platform where we're hosting daily sessions uh, in conjunction with both our preferred partners as well as the lender members within TMC, and where the content is highly focused on emerging issues facing our industry. And the great part about it too is it's complimentary to our members and partners. Go to the next slide. Uh, this one's TMC Working Group. So the best way to coin it is it's our networking within the network. Uh, so it's a great forum for departmental leaders with our lender member organizations to be able to collaborate with like-minded peers on recurring conference call discussions. And those groups include uh, HR professionals, Community First, which is uh, particularly a CRA-focused working group, uh, our operations leaders in the operational excellence group, capital markets, uh, marketing professionals working group, as well as groups on the servicing side and women's networking. Next slide, please. And I'm highly excited to announce our return to in-person conferences coming up later this year. I think by and large, our members and partners see this as probably the largest of all the benefits within their membership with the Mortgage Collaborative. And so as you can see by some of the images on the screen, we're returning back live September 19th through the 21st at the Terrania Resort, Palos Verdes, California. Um, so these events are fantastic, really about a three-day uh, deep dive into, you know, highly informal and interactive breakout sessions and completely dictated by the feedback of our lender members as far as the content that they want to hear and set up in a way that's very interactive, you're not being spoken to, um, and it creates a fostered environment of inclusion within our network and partners and members alike always walk away from these in-person events uh, with stronger, great ideas to help uh, implement into their operation when they come back home. On the next slide, please. And our collaboration labs this is a great benefit for our lender members. We had over 80 members participate in 2020, expecting that number to expand nearly to 100 in the current year. And the labs are consisted of key decision makers, typically at the C-suite level, um, in groups, anywhere between six and 15 of our lender member companies of similar size and scope that don't directly compete with one another. So it creates an environment where lenders feel comfortable, you know, letting their guard down and really digging in under the hood of their operations uh, to talk about the challenges they're facing, um, their third party experiences, positive, negative, or indifferent, and really leverage the collective leadership and expertise and experience of one another uh, to help their organizations grow, realizing that, you know, especially in the mid market, there's enough of the pie within our industry for us all to work together uh, to help grow our businesses and stay competitive versus the largest organizations in mortgage banking. Next slide, please. And last but certainly not least, 
uh, would be our preferred partner network. And our preferred partner ne ne network makes up more than 65 best in class organizations um, across the mortgage origination lifecycle that help support the needs of our lender members. And they provide unique benefits and discounted pricing to our members to help them stay competitive while also improving their operational efficiency by being able to outsource some of the needs they have uh, through some of the best organizations in our industry on the compliance side, on technology, uh, you name it, we've got partnerships that can support our memberships. And I think the biggest benefit to the members is really the benefit of their discount pricing helps pay for and then some their membership costs with the mortgage collaborative on an annual basis uh, so if you like more information about the mortgage collaborative you can feel free to contact myself or any member of our mortgage collaborative team and on that note i will go ahead and gracefully turn it back over to james and, and let you take it away from here all right. Well, listen, thank you very much, Tom. Uh, for anyone who is interested in learning more about TMC, uh, this PowerPoint will be made available to all today's attendees, along with a follow-up FAQ that we will prepare in response to any questions that we receive uh, following today's webinar. Given the amount of information that we have packed in here today, uh, I know we allotted 60 minutes, but we're likely to go more towards 90 minutes. If you are not able to attend the full program, please do know the PowerPoint as well as a recording of the presentation will be made available to all today's attendees. Now, without further ado, as much as everyone would like to see the events of 2020 through the rear view mirror, uh, COVID-19, contentious presidential election, and so on, uh, it's clear that 2020 proved to be a record-breaking year for production and profits in the mortgage banking industry. Albeit this increased production was a silver lining of 2020, Many in our industry spent more of their time and attention on meeting their increased hiring needs than they did on meeting their ongoing regulatory compliance needs. Still, with our slowly but surely moving past the trials and tribulations of 2020, the increase in regulatory scrutiny promised by the new Biden administration uh, and leadership at the CFPB looms large. Now, given the increased scrutiny, this webinar is again meant to provide a high-level overview of some of the hottest compliance topics and trends within the industry today, and which we have broken down into these nine different sections. To start off, with regard to the CARES Act, which is officially named the Coronavirus Aid, Relief, and Economic Security Act, I'm not going to spend that much time getting into the many nuances given the number of webinars and volume of information that I'm sure all of you uh, have been inundated with. Still, with the former President Trump having signed the CARES Act into law, we received our first $2 trillion package primarily aimed at combating the economic damage resulting from the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, unlike the most recent $1.9 trillion package that is being signed into law and which addresses the economic harm from the pandemic fallout, along with many other policy goals whose ties to the pandemic may be somewhat tenuous and which will soon be the subject of further industry webinars. Of course, as everyone is or should be aware, the House approved the American Rescue Plan Act of 2021 just yesterday. And after we have an opportunity to digest the rescue plan, we will be providing a follow-up webinar to go over everything contained therein, as well as how such interacts with the CARES Act. Now, this slide sets forth a number of the key provisions included in the CARES Act, including, but not limited to, the fact that the payroll measure allows employers to delay the payment of their portion of 2020 payroll taxes until 2021 and 2022. Now, the bill waives the 10% early withdrawal penalty for distributions up to $100,000 for coronavirus-related purposes retroactive uh, to January 1st of last year. Now, withdrawals are still taxed, but taxes are spread out over three years, or the taxpayer has a three-year period to roll it back over. Now, the loan limit is increased from $50,000 to $100,000 for 401k loans, as well as the fact that the required minimum distributions from IRAs and 401k plans at age 72 are suspended. Now, there's a new provision that provides an above the line deduction for charitable contributions, plus the limits on charitable contributions uh, have been changed. 
The Tax Cuts and Jobs Act net operating loss rules are also modified. The 80% rule has been lifted. The losses uh, can now be carried back five years. The excess loss limitation rules for pass-through entities had also been suspended. Now, $500 billion were to be allotted to provide loans, loan guarantees, and other investments and overseen by Treasury Department Inspector General. These loans will not exceed five years and cannot be forgiven. For the financial services industry, the Act provides some relief for both student loans and mortgages. Uh, although the CARE Act, CARES Act had suspended payments on federally backed student loans through September of last year, the, the relief offered to the mortgage industry has been a bit more complex than that of the student loans. At a high level, the guidance issued to date, and in many instances required by federal agencies or governmental bodies, called for the suspension of evictions and foreclosures for at least 60 days, uh, the availability of forbearance options for up to 12 months, and limitations on the type of negative information that may be reported uh, to the credit bureaus. Specifically, HUD had been ordered by the President Trump on March 18th uh, of last year to suspend evictions and foreclosures for a period of 60 days. However, this particular moratorium only applied to homeowners with FHA insured mortgages for single family homes. The order not only prevented new foreclosure actions, but also suspended all foreclosure actions that were currently in process at that time. Along those lines, we have also seen a number of states follow suit in a very similar matter. As we've all heard by now, the FHFA has also ordered the GSE or had also ordered the GSEs to offer additional support to homeowners. Both Fannie and Freddie had and have specific websites that are dedicated to the COVID-19 response and the various accommodations they were making to help support homeowners and the broader lending industry. Now, one of the most impactful areas that the GSE provi GSEs provided guidance on was with respect to appraisals insofar as they had expanded the type of appraisals they would accept, including desktop and exterior only appraisals in certain circumstances. For primary resident purchase transactions, they would now accept desktop or exterior only appraisals. For rate and term refis owned by the GSEs, they would also accept exterior only appraisals in lieu of a full traditional appraisal. Of course, the GSEs have encouraged lenders to utilize any inspection waivers that the AUS may return as well. Additionally, the GSEs provided some guidance on verification of employment or income done prior to close, in that they clarified that acceptable forms of pre-closing VOEs included an email from an employer's work, uh, email IDing the name and title of the verifier, a year-to-date pay stub for the, for the period immediately preceding the note date, and evidence of direct deposit. Importantly, they also recommended enhanced due diligence on ensuring a homeowner's ability to repay. Now, this is something we've recommended as well, especially with news that some large aggregators like Penny Mac uh, may have required repurchase on loans that go into forbearance within the first 15 days after their purchase. Now, as we know, many of the updates were related specifically to servicing. Uh, as noted on the prior slide, a significant portion of the guidance to date had been focused around the forbearance plans available to homeowners. Now, the GSEs explicitly confirmed that COVID-19 is an eligible hardship under existing guidelines, meaning that servicers can offer traditional hardship workouts to these homeowners. Now, this helps to ease the implementation as processes should be all the same. However, we do want to call out that both agencies have indicated uh, that specific codes must be used when identifying a loan that is in forbearance due to COVID-19. Of course, there is also guidance that the forbearance plans should not be reported negatively to the credit bureaus. And interestingly and importantly, they also clarify that relief is available regardless of occupancy, uh, owner-occupied, second home, investment, or even in some cases, unoccupied. Now, I wanna note that the CFPB had issued their own guidance that indicates they will be or had been loosening up their enforcement and examination procedures with regard to servicers who were responding in good faith to the crises. This includes potential delays in responding to requests due to volume. This had been one of the great focuses of the regulators. Now getting to the issue of the mortgage forbearances, you know, as briefly mentioned, 
the FHFA has been providing forbearances to borrowers impacted by the coronavirus for up to 12 months due to hardship. Homeowners impacted by this national emergency are eligible for a mortgage forbearance plan to reduce or suspend their mortgage payments for up to that 12 month period. Waiving assessments of penalties and late fees, uh, credit bureau reporting of past due payments of borrowers in a mortgage forbearance plan as a result of hardships that are attributable or were attributable to this national emergency are suspended. Uh, after forbearance, uh, the servicers must work with the borrowers on a permanent workout option to help maintain or reduce monthly payment amounts as necessary, including loan modifications. Now, with the additional relief options, there was a lot of confusion for both borrowers and lenders. While the bill had sought to alleviate the financial burden on homeowners by allowing them flexibility on their payments, the measures had been plagued by vagaries and confusion among lenders and borrowers alike. What's clear is that the idea of delaying one's mortgage payments during these economically trying times had proved exceptionally popular. However, the actual requirements of a forbearance may have surprised borrowers. Uh, as the CFPB website states, if a borrower can make their mortgage payments, they obviously should. Uh, and as they further explain, a forbearance doesn't erase what a borrower owes. The borrower still has to repay any missed or reduced payments in the future uh, when that forbearance may have ended. Traditionally, servicers have required lump sum repayments. However, under the CARES Act, Fannie and Freddie are two servicers who confirmed they were not going to require lump sum payments and would work with consumers on modifications. Now this act provides that all debt obligations subject to a foreclosure agreement or forbearance agreement rather should be treated as current. In addition, all federally backed mortgage loans are subject to the forbearance. Now, a federally backed mortgage loan is obviously identified or defined, uh, and that would be in section 4022, subsection A2. But for the purpose of the protections discussed in this update, a federally backed mortgage loan is a loan that's secured by a first or subordinate lien on residential real property, including individual units of condos and co-ops designed principally for the occupancy of one to four families and is insured by the FHA insured under Section 255 of the National Housing Act, guaranteed under Section 184 or 184A of the Housing and Community Development Act of 92, guaranteed or insured by the VA, guaranteed, insured, or made by the Department of Agriculture, or purchased or securitized by Fannie or Freddie. Around two thirds of the mortgage loans in the US had fallen within these categories. Concerning the forbearance conundrum, what happened if a borrower asked for a forbearance before the loan was sold to the secondary market? That was a conundrum that happened at the very early stages of this pandemic last year. Now, as a loan is not federally backed until the loan is sold, uh, investors were refusing to buy if a borrower had requested a forbearance. So if, G if, if GSEs wouldn't buy, insure, or back the loans, then they would not meet the definition of that federally backed mortgage. So the CARES Act obligation may not have applied. Now the analysis ended, however, once the loan was purchased or insured. After purchase, the CARES Act applied and then forbearance was required if requested, which caused another big point of confusion in our market. In determining whether a lender was or is subject to an EPD, if the loan goes into forbearance, lenders should always begin by looking at your particular investor agreements. Uh, and what the EPD provision in it states. A legitimate argument for lenders is how a borrower can be considered to have missed a payment if, under Section 4021, the loan is current. Now, a converse point for the investors is that Section 4021 is for the purpose of reporting credit, while investor agreements are private agreements. The CARES Act did not address this issue because, as already stated, these are private agreements. Lenders approved directly with Fannie, Freddie, or Ginny may have other outlets to sell these loans to. However, as we all know, using only a single outlet causes liquidity and hedging havoc. Okay, now we'll move on to business continuity and disaster recovery or BCP or business continuity plans, which lenders should have already deployed. The issue here is how effectively lenders manage this process. 
it is critical that during this time, you monitor and revise your plans as necessary if you have not already done so. While this is the new normal for the time being, it is a great way to understand where some of the potential cracks or failures are in your plans. Once those are identified, you should obviously work to fix them as soon as practicable or at least flag them to come back to and fix once business as usual resumes. Look into the future, auditors will be reviewing how well your plans actually worked. Typically, your plans should have provisions on documenting compliance with the plan, and generally, the following areas should be addressed. Maintaining data integrity, especially with remote work. Communication plans. Revising plans that did not deal with a nationwide disaster such as a pandemic. Educating your employees, customers, and other stakeholders about fraud and scams that are related to the coronavirus. Here, you should be aware of fraudsters pretending to be public health officials, phishing emails, and cyber criminals working to deliver malware using COVID-related emails or messages. Now, the Federal Financial Institutions Examination Council, or FFIEC, which is the federal interagency body developed to provide uniform standards and principles for examinations and reports by federal regulators of financial institutions, including FRB, FDIC, NCUA, OCC, and CFPB, had issued guidance highlighting areas of particular interest to lenders. Now, there are distinct differences between pandemic planning and traditional business continuity planning. To address the unique challenges posed by a pandemic, the financial institution's plans should provide for First, a preventative program to reduce the likelihood that an institution's operations will be significantly affected by a pandemic event, including monitoring of potential outbreaks, educating employees, communicating and coordinating with critical service providers, and so on. Now, it's important to remember, take the lessons learned from this time uh, over the last year plus to help enhance the protocol uh, in the event we uh, uh, have some other pandemic or other emergency, which in this day and age is not unforeseeable. Now, a documented strategy that provides for scaling the institution's pandemic efforts so that they are consistent with the effects of a particular stage of a pandemic outbreak, such as the six intervals described by the Center for Disease Control and Prevention, or the CDC. Now, a comprehensive framework of facilities systems or procedures that provide the organization the capability to continue its critical operations in the event that large numbers of the institution staff are unavailable for prolonged periods. Such procedures could include social distancing to minimize staff contact, telecommuting, redirecting customers from branch to electronic banking services, or conducting operations from alternative sites. Consideration should be given toward visitor procedures and whether restrictions should be implemented for visitors accessing your facilities. Now, the framework should consider the impact of customer reactions and the potential demand for and increased reliance on online banking, telephone banking, ATMs, and call support services. In addition, consideration should be given to possible actions by public health officials and other government authorities that may affect critical business functions of a financial institution. Uh, you should also have a testing program to ensure that your pandemic planning practices and capabilities are effective and will allow critical operations to continue regardless. Uh, an oversight program to ensure ongoing review and updates to the pandemic plan so that policies, standards, and procedures include up-to-date relevant information provided by governmental sources or by the institution's monitoring program. Now, please be sure to check your state regulators as well. For example, uh, New York had required lenders to submit a response to DFS describing the institution plan, institution's plan of preparedness to manage the risk of disruption to its services and operations. Finally, one thing I wanna call uh, out here is the need to continue focus on security and privacy. Many companies were forced to transition remote work with little to no notice or pre-planning and testing. 
while we are all modern businesses and have technology to help us accomplish all of this, it's critically important to remember that this can potentially expose you and your companies to new security and privacy gaps. Customer information is still sensitive and always will be. Reinforce your employees that while we are all adapting and have been adapting uh, for quite some time, they must still take reasonable steps to ensure information remains confidential. Now this leads us into the next topic of consumer privacy. Federal laws on consumer data privacy and data security cover various industries and individuals. Financial institutions are governed by the Graham Leach Bliley Act or GLBA, uh, which has gaps for different aspects of information security. To cover those gaps, there are over 50 different non-federal data breach laws throughout the United States. Multiple states have even enacted task force operations. Uh, for instance, in California, it passed the California Consumer Privacy Act, one of the strongest state privacy regulations in the nation. Following in the footsteps of the European Union's General Data Protection Regulation, uh, or GDPR, the CCPA's aim is privacy control and transparency in data practices. The CCPA declares that the right of privacy is an inalienable right and fundamental to privacy rights is the ability of all consumers to control the use, including the sale, of personal information. Now, while the CCPA only applies to residents of California, lenders nationwide will feel the effects of this new law. So the big question that lenders should be asking at this point, is there a legitimate business purpose for retaining the information? A business or service provider shall not be required to comply with the consumer's request to delete the consumer's personal information if it is necessary for the business or service provider to maintain the consumer's personal information in order to complete the transaction for which the person in personal information was collected, provide a good or service requested by the consumer, or reasonably anticipated within the context of a business's ongoing business relationship. Audit preparedness. While the CFPB undergoes changes and possibly a refocus of their energy, we can expect the individual states to maintain or even ramp up their examination processes. New York, Massachusetts, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, and California had already launched a mini version of the CFPB designed to pick up the slack in areas they perceive the CFPB is not being proactive on. And many other states have legislation to do the same that is in the works. The states will establish their own definition of what is or is not proactive enough. Now, a review of vendors' internal procedures and activities in general is also essential to an organization having a high level of audit preparedness. In the mortgage industry, the potential for an audit is often associated with either fear or uncertainty, regardless of whether the auditing entity is a federal regulator, such as the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, or CFPB, a state agency, or an investor. At the root of an audit is the intent to determine if mortgage companies are complying with the guidelines designed to protect consumers from unfair lending practices. So what can you do to prepare? Understanding the need to build a sufficient compliance infrastructure before an auditor comes to view is step number one. In addition to the obvious goal of not falling out of compliance, adhering to established policy and procedures practices is vital for being prepared for an unexpected or expected visit from a regulator. Audits are announced with only a few weeks notice, so auditors often look for high comfort levels among employees to determine if they convey a sense of familiarity and awareness of the regulations put in place or if the company actions are different than what is presented on their paper. If your organization is proactive, much of what is needed already exists in this environment. If not, now is the time to get ready for the audit and ensure that your organization is always audit ready. Uh, and as mentioned at the outset, with the new Biden administration, with the new leadership uh, coming into the CFPB, uh, we are expecting and uh, uh, fully anticipate that regulatory scrutiny will increase. 
And now is the time to make sure that you dot the I's and you cross the T's. A few basic present preparation steps can help in ensuring your organization has the awareness auditors are looking for. One, begin preparing before the audit even develops. This is critical. Uh, it's a critical first step in avoiding a mad scramble, stressful meetings, poor deliverables, angry management, bad findings, and so on. Start with a policy management program that includes comprehensive consumer coverage. Policies and other documents are typically requested before the audit team comes on site. Having these materials organized, consistent, and with documented review dates, changes, approvals, certifications, and training is essential to getting started on the right foot. Now, your internal documentation should include policies and procedures, organizational charts, and documentation of how your compliance management system functions. This is a good time to ensure your documents are current and to identify any gaps that you may have. Effective organizations are continually changing their operations and often performing remediation activities. Now, remediation takes many forms, including procedural changes, organizational realignment, data remediation, and system changes. It is guaranteed and expected that there will be some type of remediation in progress while your audit is occurring, as ongoing monitoring and corrective action is part of the compliance management system. As part of exam preparation, it is critically important to ensure that remediation plans are very well defined, documented, and aligned with what specifically they are remediating. Progress must be tracked and resolutions reviewed and monitored which will demonstrate to the auditors that your organization has an ongoing compliance-focused operation. Now, make sure that your procedures and department-level activity are aligned with your policies. Policies that don't have supporting procedures that can be explained by the front lines, aka the business departments, are just risks waiting to be exploited. You need to ask, how are you enforcing and executing this policy? Understanding your consumer data and flow of information is critical. Expect that an auditor will want to follow the data from your organization out to any of the third-party services that are involved in mortgage transactions, you know, escrow agents, title insurers, brokers, closing agents, and so on, or within other vendors like customer service centers. Your third party monitoring is critical in the eyes of the regulators to protect the consumers. Now, be effective at coordination, information gathering, and explanation. You should have a structured process for what to do when an audit happens, who will be the lead, how document requests to various groups will be handled, and which reporting format will be used to present and detail that information. Having everyone know that all hands on deck are required and how to respond to inquiries is essential in showing the company's internal strength in terms of execution, consumer protection, and transparency within processes. Do your homework. Upon receipt of the notification letter, it's important to be fully aware of the scope of the review. To prepare for the visit, it is very helpful to understand the context of the review and anticipate the questions that will be asked. Vendor management and oversight. So while an audit can become a significant time burden and you know, it is quite intrusive, it's important to remember that unlike financial audits, regulatory auditors aren't there to analyze your bottom line. They're acting on behalf of the consumer. And this is why the CFPB's and other regulators examination manuals place such an emphasis on inspecting a firm's practices to determine if any violations exist that can potentially violate the law or cause consumer harm. Now, as I just mentioned, your third-party monitoring is critical in the eyes of the regulators to protect the consumers, which is why this should be a top priority in your compliance management program and audit preparedness. The CFPB recognizes that the use of service providers is often an appropriate business decision for institutions, but the commitment to protecting the consumer must be evident 
within third party vendor relationships in addition to your own organization. The mere fact that an organization enters into a business relationship with a service provider does not absolve the organization of responsibility for complying with federal consumer financial laws to avoid consumer harm. Now, a service provider that is unfamiliar with the legal requirements that are applicable doesn't make efforts to implement those requirements or that exhibits weak internal controls can harm consumers and create potential liabilities for both the service provider and the organization. Depending on the circumstances, legal responsibility may lie with the lender as well as with the supervised service provider. Regulators advise that institutions must integrate and support an effective overall framework for product design, delivery, and administration across their entire product and service life cycle and are required to manage relationships with service providers to ensure compliance with applicable federal consumer financial laws. With the constantly changing regulatory landscape and the sheer number of relationships with partners, vendors, and customers, corporate policies have never been so important. By constructing a defensible policy framework and working with parameters that should support your internal procedures, it becomes possible to demonstrate the impact your organization has on protecting the consumer interest when applying for a loan throughout the chain of parties involved in fulfilling it. <clears throat> now, an appropriate risk management program should include, should include, at a minimum, an appropriate risk review based on the size, scope, complexity, importance, and potential for consumer harm of the services being performed, initial and ongoing due diligence reviews to verify that the service provider understands and is capable of complying with federal consumer financial laws. The service provider conduct oversight for appropriate training and oversight of employees or agents that have consumer contact or compliance responsibilities. And the institution has included in its contract with the service provider clear expectations about compliance as well as appropriate and enforceable consequences for violating any compliance-related responsibility. Now, that includes engaging in discrimination and unfair, deceptive, or abusive acts or practices. The institution has established internal controls and ongoing monitoring to determine whether the service provider is complying with federal consumer financial laws. And the institution should be taking prompt action to fully address any problems identified through the monitoring process, including terminating the relationship where that's appropriate. Okay, get, getting to one of the subjects that we are uh, uh, contacted on a weekly, if not daily basis by our clients. Uh, as we know, the original LO comp rule went into effect in January of 2014. However, despite the fact that the rule has been in place for many years, some changes and evolution to the rule have taken place. And we continue to receive many inquiries about these uh, uh, types of issues and questions uh, revolving around LOCOM. So therefore, I, I wanna take a moment to provide some additional information for you here. First, the rule prohibits a lender from compensating an LO based on the loan terms or a proxy for loan terms other than the loan amount. When determining if a factor is a proxy for a term or a of a transaction, you have to engage always in this two-part test that's been set forth. A factor is a proxy for a term of a transaction if, one, the factor consistently varies with a term or terms of the transaction over multiple transactions, and two, the LO has the ability either directly or indirectly to add, drop, or change the factor when originating the transaction. Remember, this is a two-part test that must be engaged in. Now, the rule also prohibits compensation from both the consumer and another person, meaning the LO cannot receive a commission from both the borrower and the company, uh, as an example. The rule did provide seven examples of what would not be considered a proxy of a loan term, which are reviewed quickly uh, in this section. You know, of course, the Bureau indicated that these seven are not an exhaustive list. However, if the method is not on the list, 
you really should exercise caution. Uh, and whether you have in-house counsel or outside counsel, uh, you should go ahead and take a look at that and make sure that you are dotting the I's and crossing the T's, especially if you have any uncertainty. Now, with regard to these uh, uh, safe harbors, uh, the first is payment based on the LO's overall volume, either their total dollar amount of credit extended or total number of transactions originated during a specific time period, uh, which is, again, permissible. Long-term performance of the originator's loans. The hourly rate of pay to compensate the LO for actual hours worked. Keep in mind that it is acceptable and very common to pay a base rate for hours worked on top of a commission that's been earned. Now, whether the consumer is an existing customer of the credit or a new customer, that is also in the safe harbor. Uh, paying a flat fee for every loan originated, but you got to keep in mind that this can be tiered as well. For example, for zero to five loans originated, the LO shall receive $200 per loan. Six to 10 loans originated, the LO uh, will receive $250 per loan. And for more than 10 loans originated, the LO should receive $300 per loan, by example. Um, you can also consider the percentage of applications submitted that actually close. And then the seventh safe harbor is the quality of the LO's loan files, such as accuracy and completeness uh, of the loan documents. And this kind of gets in, we'll talk about in a, in a few minutes, uh, with regard to concerns about EPDs, um, you know, bad, uh, uh, bad files, uh, and what have you, um, and is a substitute for the, you know, uh, always desired clawback. Now, this slide with the LO compensation rule breaks down the permissible versus the non-permissible structures. And I just wanted to quickly go over some examples of popular permissible compensation structures, but also structures we commonly come across that we recommend avoiding. Uh, first, I'll go over the permissible structures. Um, looking at plans that vary by loan officer, one question we frequently get is whether we can, whether our clients can pay our originator, their originators in the same state or the same branch different amounts. And the answer is yes. Some originators are better than others, and the amount you pay to each may vary from one state to another or even within the same branch. There's no requirement that you pay all your originators the same amount simply that whatever you pay any given LO complies with the LO comp rule. Uh, toggling between borrower and lender pay. Now we've been asked frequently whether you can allow a broker to choose borrower paid compensation on one transaction and lender paid compensation on another transaction in the same day or month. And the, here the answer is again, yes. Your loan originator can toggle back and forth between borrower paid and lender broker paid from transaction to transaction. According to the rule and the commentary, the prohibition against dual compensation is transaction specific. Of course, that being said, as a lender, you will need to ensure that you have proper oversights of this. And we recommend once a transaction starts off one way, that it should be kept that way. Now, plans that provide for a minimum and maximum compensation for a transaction. You can set up plans that provide for a floor and a cap so long as these minimums and maximums do not vary with each transaction. For example, it's permissible to pay your LO uh, one and a quarter percent of the loan amount as compensation subject to a $1,000 minimum payment and $5,500 maximum payment sign-on bonuses, uh, as well as initial guarantees. We often receive a question inquiring whether a newly hired LO can receive a sign-on bonus or a question asking if an LO can receive a guarantee during a specific period of time. These are both permissible and quite common. Uh, pick a plan. In these instances, the LO is presented with multiple compensation plans, and the LO can elect which plan they want to get paid on. This is permissible so long as none of the plans presented to the LO independently violate the LO comp rule. What about periodic changes to the plans? Now, it's important to understand that you can modify your LO comp agreements. That being said, we recommend you do not change plans all that frequently. And for retail plans, 
we recommend not more than once every six months, but certainly no more frequently than quarterly. Also, it is important that any changes apply prospectively only, meaning the compensation will apply to only the applications taken on or after the date of the change. What about non-permissible structures? I wanna quickly review some structures that we would recommend against implementing. Uh, and this would include varying compensation by loan products. Remember that the loan originated comp rule prohibits basing the loan officer's compensation on a term of a loan. Terms include interest rate, APR, qualifying credit score, amongst others. And a loan product is essentially a bundle of terms. So if you vary your LO's comp by loan product, it's entirely possible you are basing the pricing uh, uh, on a few loan terms that make up that bundle of terms, which we call a loan product. What about sliding scale percentages? When paying loan originator comp based on a percentage of the loan amount of specific transactions, the percentage must be fixed and cannot vary with the amount of credit extended. So for example, you can't pay an LO 1% for loan amounts more than $250,000, 1.5% for loans between 150 and 250,000, and a 2.5% for loans uh, with amounts less than 150,000. Varying compensation based on sold versus retained portfolio. Well, since lenders typically choose whether to sell or hold a loan based on the loan terms, for example, holding in portfolio 71 arms but selling 30 or fixed, uh, or holding in portfolio loans that are conventional but selling loans that are FHA. Now, since the LO usually advises the borrower which type of loan to choose, this would be considered a proxy of a loan term. In fact, this is a scenario used by the CFPB itself to illustrate what a proxy is. What about compensation pools? It was something probably all of you are aware, but paying a bonus to an LO out of a bonus pool based on the lender's profits from all of its LOs is not permissible. In these situations, you are simply compensating the LO based on the terms of multiple transactions by multiple LOs. This is another example the CFPB explicitly called out as prohibited in its commentary. All right, as we all know, not everything is cut and dry or black and white and various gray areas do exist within the regulations, including within the Ellicott rule. I'll now quickly discuss for four practices which fall into this gray area. The first two may be permissible, but we recommend enhanced caution when implementing one and them. The first is varying compensation by state. While this is not expressly prohibited, it is possible that it could give rise to fair lending concerns or be a proxy for a term of a transaction. For example, if you have a higher proportion of borrowers uh, of a protected class in one state versus another, the LOs receive more compensation at a cost to the consumers in that state. It could result in unintended fair lending violations. The second is reducing compensation to cover fees, such as rate lock extension fees or fee tolerance cures. While updates to the rule have clarified this is permissible, it is only permissible in very specific situations in which the change was a result of unforeseen changes. The burden of proof is going to be on you as the lender to demonstrate this was an unforeseen change. As such, we typically caution our clients against implementing these types of provisions. Now, the next two examples are plan elements that are questionable and we recommend avoiding. The first is an EPO or EPD clawbacks, as I had referenced earlier. The rule does not expressly, expressly address this, but it does say that compensation should be set in advance. Additionally, such clawback provisions have the potential to violate state-specific employment and wage laws. As such, we highly recommend against this. So you gotta keep in mind, you can, however, change an LO's comp prospectively based on the historical performance as an alternative approach. The second is paying differently for purchase versus refinance. While this is not expressly carved out as, a prohibited, as being prohibited in the rule, it is certainly possible it would be considered a proxy for a term or bundle of terms as noted earlier.
Okay. Now, most employees are entitled to be paid minimum wage. They're also entitled to overtime wages when they work more than eight hours in a workday, more than 40 hours in a work week, or seven consecutive days. This is all governed by the Fair Labor Standards Act. In the final updated rule, the Department of Labor is raising the standard salary level from the currently enforced level of $455 per week to $684 per week, uh, equivalent to $35,560 per year for a full year worker. Raising the total amount or total annual compensation requirement for highly compensated individuals or employees from the currently enforced level of $100,000 per year to $107,432 per year. The FLSA does, does include exemptions. Uh, the duties test, which require that employees meet certain duty requirements in order to be exempt from overtime, has not changed. In addition to the expressly enumerated job types, the FLSA states that employees employed as, bona, as a bona fide executive, administrative professional, and outside sales employees, and certain computer employees, may be considered exempt from both minimum wage and overtime pay. These are sometimes called the white collar exemptions. The Fair Labor Standards Act exempts from its minimum wage and overtime standards employees who qualify as outside sales employees. There are nevertheless important criteria outlined in both federal and state regulations that must be met before an employee can be classified as an outside salesperson. When those criteria are not satisfied, the exemption does not apply and normal wage and hour laws must be followed. For an employee to qualify for the outside sale employee exemption under these regulations, the following criteria must be met. First, you must have the primary duty of making sales or obtaining orders or contracts for services uh, or the use of facilities and must customarily and regularly perform his or her primary duty away from the employer's place of business more than half of the working time. Now, although there are several criteria, location really is the most critical. Paying overtime compensation to mortgage loan originators can be you know, fairly complex, difficult, and cumbersome, uh, you know, to, to say the least. LOs often work non-standard, flexible, or changing schedules seeking to be available to potential borrowers, realtors, and others at almost any time of the day. Now, keeping track of constantly changing work hours can be tricky at best. This is added to a compensation structure that may involve multiple compensation methods and compensation standards. Now, a mix of compensation types is a competitive way to remain, retain your top talent, but it really makes the calculation of their weekly overtime rate of pay a real challenge. Job titles do not determine exempt status. In order for an exemption to apply, an employee's specific job duties and salary must meet all the requirements of the Department of Labor's regulations. Okay, view that. Standards for unfair deceptive practices or deceptive abuse acts or practices. Under the Dodd-Frank Wall Street Reform and Consumer Protection Act, Dodd-Frank Act, all covered persons or service providers are legally required to refrain from committing unfair, deceptive, or abusive acts or practices, practices again, collectively, these are called UDAPs, in violation of the act. Often, UDAP is a tool that the CFPB uses when it finds an unsavory practice that does not fit neatly within its other rules. So, for, for instance, uh, if the CFPB were to find that although a company is paying a loan originator the same compensation on every loan, the originator is nonetheless steering consumers into particular loans or loan terms that are not in their best interest. That may be something that the CFPB takes a look at to see whether the practice is unfair, deceptive, or abusive, and whether the company knew or should have known about it. Okay, fair lending. While fair lending rules and regulations have existed for quite some time, we're starting to see a resurgence of regulators, both federal and state, focusing in on fair lending enforcement. As such, I wanna provide a quick review of fair lending requirements in general. 
Now it's important to note that there is no single fair lending regulation, but rather that multiple federal regulations and some state specific regulations make up a suite of fair lending rules which collectively prohibit unlawful discrimination. However, from a federal perspective, the two most common regulations are the Equal Credit Opportunity Act, or ECOA, and the Fair Housing Act. Now, ECOA's provisions prohibit discrimination based on race, religion, national origin, sex, marital status, and age, as well as discriminating against a borrower based upon whether their income is derived from any public assistance program or if they are exercising their rights under the Consumer Credit Protection Act. Now, likewise, the Fair Housing Act prohibits discrimination based on race or color, national origin, religion, sex, uh, familial status, or handicap. Uh, another regulation that is heavily involved in fair lending compliance is the Home Mortgage Disclosure Act, or HUMDA. HUMDA requires that the lenders disclose information it has gathered about the applicants, including race, ethnicity, and gender. The HUMDA filings are actually available to the public and the data in HMDA filings can be used not only by regulars, but by private parties to perform fair lending analyses to determine if a lender has potential redlining or practices that violate fair lending regulations. Now, as, as it's been emphasized throughout this webinar and uh, uh, other education I'm sure you've had, it's important to remember that states can and often do have their own fair lending and anti-discrimination regulations that may go above and beyond what the federal regulations cover. For example, many states now expressly prohibit discrimination based on sexual orientation as well. And finally, as part of this overview, it's important to remember that fair lending violations can be, and typically are, unintentional. There are three main fair lending violation types. There's overt discrimination, there's the disparate impact and disparate treatment. In the disparate impact and disparate treatment, it's often the case that the policies, procedures, or practices carried out by a lender or employee unintentionally result in a protected class being treated differently and unfairly by the lender or employees. So you gotta keep in mind that your best intentions will not necessarily exempt you or excuse you from fair lending violations. Now, all lenders should have an established fair lending program. That being said, as is the case with compliance management systems in general, a fair lending program can and should be tailored to the size and complexity of your operation. A small lender will not be able to support or be expected to have the same complexity in a fair lending program as a national top tier lender. However, there are many elements of a fair lending program that a lender of almost any size can implement to help ensure their compliance, including comprehensive fair lending training for all your staff. It is important that all your employees are aware of their role in ensuring all borrowers receive equal access to credit. Of course, loan officers and underwriters are the employees that are most critical to ensure they receive the proper training uh, that being said, staff in all areas, including support areas, can be critical in helping to identify fair lending red flags. Now, we always recommend that a lender has clear underwriting and credit guidelines that are easily accessible by all underwriting staff and employees in general. It's important that these guidelines clearly support equal access to credit and do not contain any discriminatory statuses or language. While some lenders simply adopt the GSE, agency, or investor guidelines, it's important that if you have any overlays, uh, that they are clearly published and documented. This will help to ensure that your credit box is applied equally to all borrowers. Um, now, we always recommend a second review, or two to say no, uh, is performed on all declined loans. This is an easy mitigation control to put in place and helps to ensure that all borrowers are given proper consideration. Now, lenders should also have a formal process in place to track and monitor complaints. While this may not seem to be directly related to fair lending, tracking the type of uh, the complaints 
the source of the complaints and the loan specifics for each complaint can play a key role in helping you to identify a pattern or practice of discrimination that you may otherwise be unaware of. Now, for lenders that reach a certain size, it is then important to ensure that you have an established and formal fair lending monitoring or testing program in place as well. As part of this testing program, we recommend conducting periodic reviews of pricing and underwriting exceptions. It's important to track and verify that any exceptions granted are not to be provided solely to non-protected class borrowers. Another key component of fair lending monitoring includes a credit quality control review of loan files, including declined loans. This again will ensure that the decisions are fully complying with your published credit guidelines. And then finally, for more mature companies, we highly recommend conducting matched pair analysis. Now, a matched pair analysis basically takes two loan files with similar characteristics, for example, subject property located in the same state or area similar loan amounts and employment status, and then compare the terms offered to a protected class borrower and a non-protected class borrower. This helps to identify if borrowers from a protected class are receiving loans with higher fees, higher rates or APRs, or have a higher declination rate. Um, also, we recommend that lenders of all sizes establish a formal whistleblower hotline or confidential reporting process. So as I noted just a few moments ago, you know, we're seeing a rise in the regulatory scrutiny of fair lending practices and programs, which of course are increasing the number of enforcement actions against lenders. Uh, very recently, as of this year, the Office of the Comptroller of the Currency entered into a consent order for alleged violations of the Fair Housing Act with multiple lenders. Specifically, the consent order was related to FH Act violations in cities relationship loan pricing program. Um, as part of that program, a borrower had an existing qualifying relationship with city, uh, were eligible to receive a credit to either a closing cost or an interest rate reduction on their loans. Ultimately, it was identified that these credits were not being uh, equally offered to all city's customers. And that as a result, some customers were adversely impacted based on their race, color, national origin, or sex. This highlights what we covered earlier, that unintended discriminatory practices can still significantly impact a lender negatively. Now, an audit of the program uh, in that case revealed that multiple internal control failures contributed to the discriminatory practices. These failures included inadequate periodic reviews of the program, inadequate training of staff, and the city's procedures did not state that LOs were required to inform all customers of their eligibility to receive the discounts when applicable. Interestingly, in this particular case, the failure was self-identified by the city and was ultimately self-reported to the OCC uh, back in 2015. While self-reporting does not prevent you from being subject to a consent order or enforcement action, we nonetheless highly recommend lenders do self-report you know, these types of issues when they're discovered. If a regulator subsequently identifies something that you knew about and hid, a far sweeping fair lending or any compliance violation, uh, the regulator will likely come down on you much harder. Now, based on the information available and its review, the OCC ultimately determined that city violated the Fair Housing Act and was assessed a $25 million civil money penalty. This was in addition to city having performed a look back of loans originated during the time period and issuing credits to borrowers that would have otherwise been eligible. It's important to keep in mind that violations of multiple statutes and regulations may be considered fair lending violations, and significant civil model penalties may indeed be levied. All right, uh, moving on to QM changes and non-QM products. The CFPB recently published two final rules revising its ability to repay a uh, qualified mortgage rule, the ATR QM rule. Uh, this rule generally requires lenders before making a residential mortgage loan to a consumer to make a reasonable good faith determination of the consumer's ability to repay 
the loan according to its terms. The amended general QM rule modifies the requirements for a loan to qualify as a general QM as well as certain other provisions in the ATR QM rule and eliminates the GSE QM rule, which is set to expire for applications received on or after the mandatory compliance date of the amended general QM rule. Now, the other final rule being called the seasoned QM rule adds a new QM category, seasoned QMs, and the seasoned QM rule defines what a seasoned QM uh, as a loan is, uh, which is secured by a first lien, has a fixed interest rate, and is not a high cost mortgage as defined in 12 CFR 1026.32a. Now that satisfies the general QM product requirements uh, of no negative amortization, interest only, or balloon payments features, uh, you know, 30, less than 30 year terms, and total points and fees generally. Uh, less than 3% of the loan, uh, for which the creditor during the underwriting process considered and verified the consumer's income or assets, debt obligations on and monthly DTI ratio or residual income in accordance with the same standards established in the amended general QM rule for general QMs. Now that, that is held in portfolio by the original creditor or the first purchaser for at least 36 months, not counting periods of temporary payment accommodation due to a disaster or war pandemic related uh, national emergency, the seasoning period, during which time the borrower had no more than two 30 day delinquencies and no delinquencies of 60 days or more. Now, by virtue of this definition, certain loans that at time of origination were not QMs or were higher priced QMs may be able to qualify for the QM safe harbor at the end of the seasoning period, but only if the loan applications uh, were received on or before April 1st, 2021, the effective date of the season QM rule. Now, both final rules become effective or had become effective on March 1st of this year. However, the amended general QM rule has a mandatory compliance date of July 1st, of this year, which means that for applications received on or after the 1st of March, uh, but before July 1st of this year, lenders may continue to make GSE QMs or choose instead to make general QMs under the new amended general QM rule. Okay, non-QM products. So we've all heard about non-QM products since the ATR and QM rules went into effect years ago. However, in the last 12 to 18 months, non-QM products and volume have experienced a significant increase. Uh, it's important to keep in mind that a non-QM loan means that it has not provided a safe harbor uh, of compliance with the ability to repay rule as QM loans are. This doesn't mean that a lender that offers non-QM products does not conduct some type of determination that the borrower has the ability to repay. Many loans that may fall under a non-QM label still are subject to the ATR requirements. Now, this means that non-QM loans are not necessarily the same as a subprime or high-risk loan or product. In fact, the significant increase in non-QM production by lenders of all types and sizes, along with a growing non-QM secondary market, would seem to indicate that many in the industry do not consider it to be the equivalent of a high-risk product. And while it doesn't necessarily mean that the loan is subprime, I do want to point out that state-specific definitions of subprime and non-traditional loans does exist, and that some characteristics of non-QM loans may trigger these definitions. While we often hear about non-QM products in a generalized, lumped-together sense, you know, it's important to understand that characteristics of a non-QM loan can vary significantly from one loan product to the next. Non-QM loans can include those with DTIs in excess of 43% or GSE agency limitations, loans offering interest-only periods, or loans where qualification is based on the non-traditional means like bank statements. Okay, now, a main risk for lenders originating non-QM products is the risk of repurchase, uh, something that we have to deal with uh, uh, in, in uh, the non-compliance side with our litigation and mitigation departments. 
Uh, as with any time where you are selling loans to an investor, it's critical to ensure that you have properly reviewed and negotiated your loan purchase agreement and that you fully understand your repurchase obligations. Um, this is something that we generally help our clients out with when they are up for renewals. Uh, and, you know, at the end of the day, it, you know, just being realistic, you know, how many changes you can get a secondary market investor to make um, are primarily or partially based on, you know, how much production you're doing. What does the value of your business mean to that investor? Uh, because depending upon who we're negotiating the MLPAs and sellers guides on behalf of, uh, we're able to get different uh, um, outcomes. Uh, but nevertheless, they are generally willing to make some changes. There are certain things that you should be on the lookout for uh, as deal breakers with uh, these agreements. Uh, but that's the subject of another webinar. And uh, uh, if you have any follow-up questions on those factors uh, or negotiating those types of agreements, uh, you know, either upstream or downstream, maybe you're looking at broker agreements, uh, by all means, please reach out to us. We would be happy to give you some uh, uh, tips uh, to help you along there. Now, originating non-QM loans may trigger additional or new disclosure requirements that you are not familiar with, or your system is not set up to generate. If you have only originated QM and GSE agency production in the last few years. Now, as noted earlier, some states may consider certain non-QM loans to be non-traditional loans and additional disclosures to consumers about their rights or counseling resources may be required. As such, we highly recommend that you engage your compliance officers uh, or an outside law firm to assist in reviewing your disclosure requirements. Now, one way to help mitigate some of the risk of non-QM production is to ensure you have a robust training program uh, in place. For example, uh, you want to ensure your LOs are properly trained not only on the product parameters, but the URLs understand when they should consider a non-QM product for the borrower. Keep in mind that non-QM loans may be higher cost to the consumer and therefore LOs should not steer consumers into these loans if other products with better options for the consumers exist. Failure to control for this can lead to a fair lending or UDAP violation. Now it's also our experience that state regulators tend to focus on non-QM products during their examinations. In fact, many states' initial examination questionnaires specifically call out whether you have originated any non-traditional or non-traditional credit transactions during the examination period. If so, they will often focus in on those loans and choose a higher sample to examine. Therefore, it's critical to ensure that you are fully aware of your disclosure requirements ahead of time and reinforces the need to ensure all your employees have received proper training. All right. Over four years ago, Fannie and Freddie announced that they were changing the Uniform Residential Loan Application Form, uh, the 1003 form, for the first time in 20 years. Now, the update was intended to modernize the form with a new layout designed to support the efficient and accurate collection of information and data and to help the industry identify ways to better support mortgage borrowers during origination and servicing. Now, as the development process had moved forward, uh, the government-sponsored uh, enterprises dictated that lenders would be required uh, to begin using the new applications by February 1st of last year. Obviously, that didn't happen. Uh, Fannie and Freddie delayed the mandatory use of the redesigned 1003, uh, and according to the GSEs, they were directed by the FHFA to make certain additional changes uh, to the form. The delay wasn't that surprising, keep in mind that the updated URLA was originally published back in 2016 and then updated in December 2017 prior to the most recent update. Gathering new data always entails both a technologically and process change. This could not, or this could make complementing the URLA com compliantly more challenging. Just as some lenders remained focused despite the trade delay in 2015, many lenders kept focused and prepared for the eventual change. Change always introduces the possibility of increased risk, especially when that change involves a critical component of the process. Last year, the redesigned URLA was released in October uh, and had integrated the directives from the FHFA. 
leading technology firms had already made the URLA related database changes and had begun the testing process in advance of the previously set optional use period. Lenders should speak with your vendors in advance uh, to make sure that you complete a review of the internal processes and procedures here. With another new staple document in the industry, what could go wrong? Well, URLA is much more than a document change, and here are the five reasons why that you should keep in mind. First, the new 1003 will require the lender to gather more borrower information than ever before. Whether the lender acquires this data online through a digital point of sale or in the branch, a new process will be required to capture the information and quality control the results. It's also no secret that borrowers already feel they're being asked for too much personal information when applying for a loan. And without a training and communications plan and predetermined processes in place, the additional information requirements will make this process and negatively uh, impact the overall borrower experience. Lenders need to take time to plan out your responses to uh, possible borrower concerns, and failure to do so could result in more abandoned apps and a declining pull-through rate. Uh, next, you know, the underwriting, processing, and secondary market departments will have to process more data for each loan with the new forms. While some of this may pass through, like home mortgage disclosure data, uh, demographic fields, others may impact how non-governmental or non-QM investors view the details. But what about secondary market considerations? Well, it's reasonable to assume that any secondary market investor will take a loan package that includes the new form. There are different investor-specific elements to consider should the lender decide to sell the loan digitally. Again, this may require lenders to develop new processes, design new training, and bring your staffs up to speed. And then finally, uh, with regard to timeliness, it's not yet clear what these changes will do uh, to the lender's loan application process. Uh, in its online FAQ document, Fannie responds to that question by reminding the industry that it doesn't prescribe how the lender handles its loan app relationship, nor how the lender should interact with the applicant or process its loan applications. While this leaves unanswered questions, uh, what's, obviously, what's obvious is that the additional information required to submit a loan for automated underwriting and purchased by the GSE is going to require more time to get the application completely cor uh, completed correct. Whatever lenders choose to do, the time to get it done is now. All right, finally, CFPB changes in MSA bulletin rescission. On October 7th of last year, the CFPB announced that it was providing clear rules of the road for RESPA marketing service agreements in the mortgage industry by rescinding its 2015 guidance regarding MSAs and issuing frequently asked questions on Real Estate Settlement Procedures Act, RESPA, uh, Section 8 topics, including FAQs addressing how RESPA Section 8 and the corresponding provisions of Reg 10 or Reg X apply to MSAs. As almost all participants in, mortgage, in the mortgage industry know, MSAs dramatically changed after the CFPB inherited responsibility for administering RESPA and Reg X from the Department of Housing and Urban Development in 2010. Under the leadership of former Director Cordray, the CFPB brought a slew of enforcement actions alleging RESPA Section 8 anti-kickback and referral fee violations, many of them connect in connections with MSAs. Now, this enforcement activity culminated in the issuance of compliance bullets in 2015-05, coined as the RESPA Compliance and Marketing Services Agreements, uh, aka the 2015 bulletin. While this and other recent CFPB actions under former President Donald Trump may indicate a general softened approach toward RESPA Section 8 and MSAs in particular, there's also great speculation on what the CFPB change in leadership under the current administration will bring. During former Craninger's tenure, the CFPB scaled back regulations for the payday lending industry, finalized rules for the debt collection industry, 
and like directors of the past, made multiple other changes to consumer finance regulation. Kreninger's tenure also saw a slowdown in enforcement when compared with the CFPB's era under former director Richard Corduroy. After former director Kraninger stepped down at President Biden's request, Dave Uejo, uh, and forgive me if I, I mispronounce that, took over as the Bureau's acting director. Uh, now, while Rohit Chopra is to be the next director of the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, um, Uejo originally joined the CFPB in 2012 as its first lead for talent acquisition where he created a recruiting program to support the startup of the Bureau. Chopra, if confirmed, would be returning to an agency in which he helped to set up after its establishment by the landmark Dodd-Frank Financial Reform Law of 2010. Although there has been no official comment, the selection of Chopra signals that the Biden administration plans to return the CFPB to a much more prominent role of the early days following three years of Trump administration appointees curbing the agency's reach. All right, now many calls that we receive start with, this company is doing this. Isn't that against the rules? Uh, why should I follow the rules if others aren't? Well, the CFPB has released bulletin after bulletin reminding not just lenders, but brokers and all participants in the financial services industry to be cautious about any production incentives they might be offering to their employees or service providers, noting that the risks these incentives may pose to consumers are significant, and both the intended and unintended effects of incentives can be complex, which makes this subject worthy of much more careful attention by institutional leadership, compliance officers, and regulators alike. And as we have seen throughout the enforcements, the consequences are not minuscule by any means. So what can you do to stay competitive and stay compliant? First, you need to educate your staff and stay abreast of enforcement actions. And it helps when the uh, staff understands why these rules exist and can then buy in. Uh, create and actually implement policy and procedures. Provide transparency on compensation processes. Self-audit measure more and then compensate based on those measurements. There's a variety of process points that can be measured, quality submissions, compliance benchmarks, almost any objective criterion other than profit. Um, so look, I, I know we covered a lot of ground. Uh, we didn't do it in great detail, but uh, for the time that we had, uh, I think we, we made it through fairly well. Um, certainly, we did not have time for questions and answers, which uh, you know we always like to do. But given the fact that we wanted to focus on the content here, I would recommend that if you have any questions or concerns about any statements or issues that contained in this webinar, that you email me with those questions. We will, over the next week, be preparing a follow-up FAQ to take all those questions that we received turn it into a follow-up document, and we'll be providing that to all the attendees today, along with a copy of this PowerPoint and a recording of this presentation. Uh, if you have any questions for uh, Tom Gallucci regarding the Mortgage Collaborative, uh, the information is contained in this PowerPoint, and I believe he also went ahead and provided you with his contact information. Again, I thank all of you for taking your valuable time to attend today's webinar. Uh, we greatly appreciate it. And uh, without further ado, uh, we will go ahead and conclude today's webinar. Uh, so once again, thank you, everybody. Have a great rest of your week and weekend. And uh, uh, please keep posted for our upcoming webinar series, uh, both in the compliance as well as the litigation realms. Thank you again.